In a recent interview with David Patrick Harry, Jonathan Peugeot mentions Timothy Petitza's speculation that after unlawfully eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam approached the tree of life, only to find the crucified Christ before him. Adam then fled, as he couldn't handle the weight of life, or to use biblical terminology, he couldn't pay the debt of his sin. Whether or not this was literally the case, it's a deeply profound insight. As Father Pavel Florensky of Blessed Memory demonstrated in his monumental book, The Pillar and Ground of the Truth, fallen rationality, i.e. the mind separated from the truth, cannot but consider the truth as antinomic or paradoxical. The consequence of the fall is division, the splintering of reality into fragments. Each of these fragments, or particulars, having been divided from the whole, or universal, assert themselves as the absolute truth. Having no justification for their reality, finding no absolute ground for their being, they attempt to ground themselves within the fragment of reality they possess, or perhaps more accurately, the fragment of reality they are. This self-enclosure of the fractured parts of reality leads to inevitable division and strife, as each strives to assert themselves as the universal, as the one in whom all others are contained. Prideful self-enclosure negates the possibility of loving one's neighbor, as the neighbor is the jerk, to quote Slavoj Žižek, who considers themselves equally singular or absolute as myself. The neighbor or other, precisely as other, threatens and, in truth, refutes the self-assertion of the prideful subject. The one-sidedness of fallen rationality is an example of a fragment of reality declaring itself the arbiter and ground of truth. But as fallen, it's inherently incomplete, alienated from the truth to one degree or another. Rationality can only know the truth by recognizing that it alone cannot find it because the truth is truly other than it. In other words, the truth is only revealed to rationality when it humbles itself in faith. This self-sacrificial humility opens up the space for the indwelling of the truth in its genuine otherness, not merely as a repetition of the self-referentiality of fallen rationality. The necessity of rationality's self-sacrifice is itself an antinomy, from the fallen perspective, because it essentially says that the faculty of knowing must openly accept its unknowing. I'm tempted to say that all antinomies, at least of the spiritual kind, are the result of the refusal to acknowledge the truth of self-sacrifice, as this is perhaps the most significant consequence of the fall. This leads us back to Petitza's speculation. What's more paradoxical than the idea that life itself is the crucified God? Life is self-sacrifice because self-sacrifice is an essential aspect of communion, and life is communion. Eternal life, life as such, is the life of the triune God. The Father eternally sacrifices himself for the sake of the Son, and the Son eternally reciprocates this complete self-offering in return. In emptying himself, the Son eternally receives the fullness of the Father's divinity. According to the Bible, the way in which we receive eternal life is through participation in the triune God as adopted sons. To do this, we must become like the eternal son. We must carry our cross and self-sacrifice. Christ on the cross is the ultimate sacrificial act. He submits to the Father and suffers unto death for humanity. On the cross, Christ is naked before all. He completely empties himself for the sake of the world. In no moment does he turn from the world, hide anything within himself, or assert his will over the Father's. Not only is he utterly open before all, but he wills this openness. Christ's self-emptying is a stark contrast to Adam and Eve, who ate from the tree of knowledge and experienced shame in the presence of one another. This shame in the face of the other leads to their attempt to create a barrier between themselves and the world with the garment of fig leaves. It's precisely the absolute openness towards the other that Adam could not handle. According to Petitza's aforementioned speculation, Adam fled from the tree of life after eating from the tree of knowledge because he couldn't bear the knowledge he received. He couldn't bear eternal life because, in his fallen state, he couldn't meet the measure of absolute openness demonstrated by Christ on the cross. We've now determined that life is essentially connected to self-sacrifice. Life is not a given, 
but a gift. The full reception of this gift is only possible through faith, as faith is the self-sacrificial humbling of rationality before the immediacy of divine infinity. The essentially gifted nature of life is obscured by the self-enclosure of the fallen subject. The fallen mode of being consists of a pattern of behavior that contradicts the essentially communal nature of being. It's a mode of being striving towards isolation, and counts every other than itself as mere objects to be used and consumed. True love begins with recognizing and accepting the other as other, followed by the perichoretic indwelling of both within a spiritual community. Sin is, quite literally, a revolt against nature, a freely willed split between one's subjective will and one's objective or real nature as image of God. The fallen subject is a fragment of reality that engages in a self-negating pseudo-movement of withdrawal from communion. Directing one's energies toward oneself slowly negates the possibility of eternal salvation. Sin is a rejection of salvation as it consists of the hostile rejection of the gift of God, which we ourselves are by nature. It is, therefore, a literal revolt against reality as such. On Golgotha, we see the self-emptying of the eternal word of God into the depths of hell while preserving the union of God and man in his divine hypostasis. Christ was naked before all and pronounced guilty by man. He didn't protest this condemnation as he didn't seek to justify himself, but was justified by the Father. The Father justified the Son by sending the Holy Spirit, by whose operation the God-man was resurrected from the grave. The Spirit is the anointing oil of the King of Kings, the one who stamped and recognizes the Son as being truly who he claims he is, the eternal Son of God. The Trinitarian nature of Christ's salvific work allows for a justification of the truth that's simply unthinkable for fallen rationality. The truth, the Logos of God, doesn't justify himself self-referentially, but is revealed as a true Savior and Lord through the Spirit of the Father resting within him and his body. The Spirit descends on the Son after the latter's final kenosis on the cross, and the same Spirit remains within the body of Christ eternally. In Christ, the eternal pattern of divine divine life is revealed, and humanity is shown its proper place within it. In many non-Christian worldviews, otherness is considered a threat. The Neoplatonic schema of the three hypostases presents a terrifyingly inhuman ontology and eschatology centered on the notion that multiplicity and communion consist of varying degrees of alienation from the one. Taken to its logical conclusion, it renders all relationships devoid of substance, nothing more than a series of alienations from the non-personal one or good. To their credit, certain later Neoplatonists advanced the argument that the three hypostases are necessitated by the outpouring of the one, the fact that true perfection consists of charity. But since in this schema, communion can only occur between higher and lesser orders of being, it can never be absolute, and will eventually be negated by the self-referential collapse of reality into the one. But Christianity recognizes that the one cannot depend upon lower orders of being to express its perfection. Orthodox Trinitarianism states that communion is intrinsic to the perfection of the one and isn't merely actualized in relation to lower levels of reality. God is one on account of the single paternal essence, and yet this essence is eternally shared by the Son and the Spirit. The otherness or distinction of the three persons is a necessary condition of the perfection of God as the self-revealed absolute. Thus, from the very peak of our theology, we recognize the inherent goodness of otherness as a condition of communion. For human beings, it's our distinction from God and one another that allows us to be united in ever-increasing communion. Communion always occurs within a space, for lack of a better term. The Father and the Son are united in perfect love, but the Spirit reveals their consubstantiality in his divine personhood. The Spirit is akin to the theater in which the divine communion takes place. He's the third hypostasis in whom the unity of God is manifested as fully actual. Seraphim Hamilton outlines the problems with the dualist understanding of God succinctly. To quote him, but there is still one outstanding question. As the Father apprehends his own qualities through knowledge of the Word, in whom does he apprehend the quality of communion? Father and Son are indeed consubstantial, but according to the aforementioned logic, their consubstantial communion has no proper manifestation. The Father moves in relation to the Son, who moves in relation to the Father, but a revelation or actualization of their union itself is lacking. 
Indeed, one seems to slip into the very problem which the posited dyad relation of father and son is supposed to resolve. If father and son complete the intradivine motion, then the creation is still required as the theater for the contemplation and knowledge of the mutual communion of father and son." Unquote. To avoid the problematic conclusion that God is dependent upon creation, Orthodox theology states that the revelation of all of God's qualities and the revelation of the quality of communion and love occurs within the Godhead eternally. All of this may seem difficult and even abstract. However, I believe it's possible to demonstrate that Trinitarian logic is the only logic capable of describing reality accurately. For example, we say of two objects, A and B, that they're unique identities, i.e. they are what they are in isolation from each other. However, upon reflection, it becomes clear that imminent or internal to the notion of A equals A is the fact that it's equally not B. Thus, B is present within the very identity of A, but only negatively so far as we've yet to move from abstractions to substantial relations. In truth, every object is only itself through a positive relation to other objects in the world, which can be verified through empirical experience. There's no way to isolate any two objects, as a complex and accurate enough analysis will reveal the influence of one upon another. Thus, A is, in truth, only itself insofar as it enters into B, and vice versa, and this entering into is imminent to both identities. This is communion. We've now transcended the abstract law of identity and discovered the inherently communal nature of being. A is always entering into B, and B is always entering into A. A is not itself prior to or abstracted from its relation to the other, and thus to describe it in truth is to describe its existence within a web of relations. Taken as abstract self-relations, A and B only represent isolated identities, and we inevitably fall into a dualism, if not an outright collapse into monism. However, taken as inherently communal, that is, always already present within a space of communion, they're revealed in their truth. The space of communion is God, in whom all creatures exist and are united together. God brings every creature out from the nothingness of their self-referential being by placing them within a network of relations, all of which find their ultimate source and ground in the first relation, i.e. God's creative act. Two objects moving towards each other in a two-dimensional space will inevitably collapse into one another, but two objects brought together and, while preserving their unity, extend beyond themselves into three-dimensional space can expand forever through increasing communion with the infinite reality other than them. A less abstract analogy can be found in the nuclear family. The husband and wife love one another, and upon having children, they love one another through loving their children. But even in the absence of children, God is the third who originally originally blesses and subsequently perfects the marriage of husband and wife as they deepen their love for one another through their love of God. All of the created trinities, the three dimensions of space, the three dimensions of time, etc., are patterned upon the eternal trinity. God the trinity is the unity of I, thou, and he. God is the personal and communal absolute. Not only is communion perfectly realized in itself through the father-son relation, but this very communion extends beyond the dyad through the Spirit's participatory revelation of the Godhead. The He, the Third, is the other of the I and Thou, who opens both to the infinity of what lies beyond them individually or dualistically. He in God stands for and exhausts true infinity. The Spirit is the same He who indwells within us and reveals the Father and the Son. Just as the Spirit justifies Christ as the eternal Son of God, we are justified by the Spirit through participation participating in the Son's death and resurrection. The Spirit is the space where the Triune Communion takes place. And I'm not depersonalizing the Spirit, as in God there are no objects, only pure subjectivity. In God, the C in which A and B are united is himself a person, and just as essential to the Godhead as the Father and the Son. Father Dimitri Steneloy of Blessed Memory says that the Father and the Son rejoice over their common possession of the Holy Spirit. That's to say, the joy of the Father and the Son isn't self-enclosed, but self-revealing, and the Spirit is the one in whom the self-revelation of the Father in the Son takes place. 
By nature, we exist as an image of this Trinitarian pattern. Each of us is an individual I in relation to the other, thou, and we participate within a network of relations between I's and thou's that are also connected to us. We exist within a common communal space with the rest of creation. The Spirit of God is the life or energy of the communal space of creation, binding all men and creatures together. But for the time being, his activity is limited, freely of course, by the reality of sin and its consequences, division, and strife. There will come a time when the fullness of God will be revealed through the indwelling of the Spirit within every inch of creation. In that time, we will be revealed as entirely contingent upon him, which is the fundamental truth of our being we so often fail to see. For those who have aligned their mode of being with the life of God, the final indwelling of the Spirit in creation will be the height of joy, the complete redemption of the world. Then eternal life will flow from the throne of God and the Lamb, and will rest in the eternal love of the triune God. But for the wicked, those who desire to remain isolated from the common communal space, the indwelling of the Spirit will be greatly terrifying. They'll attempt to flee like Adam before the crucified Christ, but there will be no place the life and love of God are not. The price of knowledge is the debt of love to the one who loved us from the beginning.